Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. Chag Sameach. Welcome. Uh, it's so nice to have you joining us. Um, my name is Miriam steinberg Egith. I'm the director of the Center City Kahila. Um, and I'm very excited, as excited as one can be about doing something this weird. Um, but this is the first piece of our virtual sukkah hop, uh, which is a chance for the community to get together, even though we can't all be together for, throughout the holiday. Um, so this is the first of nine virtual sukkah hop stops that we're having. I encourage you to visit centercityjews.org to see the rest of them um, and to sign up. It's actually the same link. So if you sign up for this one, you can use this link for all of them. Um, and I hope that people are having as happy a holiday as you can. Um, and I'm really grateful to Rabbi Abe Friedman for joining us to kick things off today. Um, as you noticed, we are recording uh, so that this will be available for people who weren't able to join us to watch later. And without anything else, since Rabbi Abe is in his sukkah, I will turn the sukkah hop over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and it's um, it's a pleasure to be uh, among friends, uh, to literally need no introduction. Um, I am actually in Rona and Eric's sukkah. Uh, we did a little sukkah swap this year, and uh, really grateful to them for uh, the use of this beautiful sukkah. Um, and grateful to my children. So some of the decorations are there, some of the decorations my kids oh, no, um, and we'll start. Baruch Atadonai Elmechalam Borei Mi Name Is Onot Baruch Atadonai Elmechalam Asher Kisham Etzatav Etzivano Leshev Basuka. All right. Code events always is that like awkward pause after you make the bracha and you eat something and then everyone's waiting for you to finish. Um, uh, so I'm, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and invite people, um, if it's quiet where you are, um, I don't think we need to mute a group this size. So um, in this way, we can just have a little bit more of an open, free-flowing discussion. Um, and I'm going to screen share, um, I'm going to screen share the text so that we can all see it. Um, the topic is home and homelessness, and this is uh, part of a larger project that BZBI is working on this week that we're calling Sukkot Shalom, using this holiday of Sukkot to uh, focus on questions of housing justice, homelessness uh, in our community, specifically here in Philadelphia. Um, so I want to highlight Wednesday night um, on the BZBI website, there's um, a link to the panel that Rabbi Annie is moderating. Um, I, can, I can get the link to copy. I can put that in. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, Rabbi Annie is moderating a panel on um, Wednesday night that will include um, people who have experienced homelessness, people who are working uh, in various ways to address housing justice. Um, and uh, also on the BZBI website, you'll see there are some social service opportunities through the week. Um, and our initial thought about this, and we'll circle back to it, is this is, um, this is a, a holiday on which we shift our pattern of living, um, in which we take our meals and, uh, when feasible, sleep in the temporary outdoor structure of a sukkah. Um, and I think that, not just with, um, and I'll ask because we're not muted, if you've got like um, alerts or something going on your devices, if you could um, just turn those down. Um, in general, this is a time where we think a little bit more about how we're living. Um, but in particular, I chose these pictures very deliberately um, because for me, every time I go up toward the Whole Foods and pass by the encampment on the parkway, um, it's driven home for me, this question of, driven home, huh? it's really, it's um, focused for me, this question of where we're living, how we're living, um, and who is able to live how I live, and who is not able uh, to live how I live, um, both in terms of the kind of house that I live in, you know, in its actual construction and so on, um, and in the implications of the kind of housing that I enjoy, um, you know, that I own a home and that I have every, I have a very comfortable and easy expectation that I will continue to live in that home. Um, 
and that that's really not shared by a great many people. The challenge in looking at this from a Jewish perspective, um, as I was preparing and looking at various um, sources, I was having a hard time finding sources that were addressing homelessness. And so I looked on Safari, you can search for keywords and find source sheets that other people have put together. If you're not familiar with safaria.org, it's um, an online Jewish text library. It's a great resource. And one of the best resources is you can find other people's source sheets for their classes. And um, so I went on Safari and I was searching uh, source sheets for homelessness and I found a bunch and uh, before Yom Tov, I downloaded them and I printed them out so that I could read through them on Yuntif and put little stickers. With, and as I was reading through the source sheets, and these were, remember, you know, four uh, workshops that people had put together to deal with the question of homelessness, there were really not a lot of sources about homelessness. Um, and so I walked over to BZBI to my office and I grabbed this book. There Shall Be No Needy by Rabbi Jill Jacobs. I'll not cover her name off the title, um, which is a really excellent book, um, uh, not, re not just about social justice, but um, really dealing in a lot of ways with um, economic justice and systemic justice. Um, and right there at the beginning of her chapter on homelessness, uh, she notes that there are really not a lot of Jewish sources dealing with homelessness. Um, so as you would imagine, this uh, it puts us in a bit of a bind for a study of homelessness. Um, so the one of the primary questions that I'm going to put on the table now, and then we are going to look at some sources and continue talking about it, but one of the primary um, questions that we're going to have to wrestle with is, uh, why is it that our tradition, which has a lot to say about um, food justice and a lot to say about economic justice, um, seems unaware of homelessness. Um, and I'm just going to let that sit. Uh, we'll go back to the sources. Um, and we're going to start here on Sukkot. Um, and this comes from the end of the Torah reading for the Yom Tov of Sukkot uh, from Parashat and more. Um, um, that the, there's the commandment for us to dwell in Sukkot for seven days. Uh, and they give us the explanation, the Torah gives us the explanation for this mitzvah. You shall dwell in booths for seven days so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Um, and it concludes, as many uh, mitzvot will conclude, I am Adonai your God. Um, so I'm going to leave this up here because I know some people are reading learners and you're going to want to read this through for yourself a couple of times, but I want to open this up and say um, kind of what, what is the Torah teaching us with this mitzvah and, um, you know, in particular recognizing that not all of our mitzvot get explanations. So there's a significance here that the Torah is explaining the reasoning behind this mitzvah. What, uh, what does it mean to you or what does it say to you to hear this? Yeah, Barbara, go ahead. Well, God is kind of being a jerk here saying you should live in booths because I told you to live in booths. And I'm wondering, um, in the story of the Exodus, I don't recall the hearing that they lived in booths when they uh, left Egypt. No, we're not told that um, explicitly. We know that they lived in booths as they were traveling through the desert because this verse says, later on in the future, you'll live in booths because in the past your ancestors did. All right, so this is one of the things, um, and I find sometimes it's helpful to like to remind ourselves that the Torah is a work of literature and it functions with all of the tools that literature functions with, right? And so one of them is um, sometimes things are implied rather than shown to us in direct exposition. 
right? And so to say, well, we it must be the case that our ancestors traveled through the wilderness in booths uh, because we're supposed to use the booths to remind us of that um, is actually like a reasonable inference for a work of literature to ask us to make. Um, and so I, I don't think that it's quite as tautological as, as you were reading it in the sense that it's not that God is saying, um, dwell, spend this holiday in booths because I told you to spend the holiday in booths. That's what we would get without the explanation. God is actually saying, spend the holiday in booths so that you maintain an awareness of your ancestors' experience of being in booths back then. Right, I mean, there's, there's an explicit um, lengthening of time here to say, um, and, and when it says, Laman Yidu Dorotechem, your generations, is saying to those Israelites who at that moment are dwelling in booths, this holiday is designed for long-term maintenance of this memory of the experience of booths. Miriam? So there's something that's interesting to me about the comparison between the role of the booths for our ancestors and the role of them for, for us, which is that these Sukkot were the alternative to essential homelessness for our ancestors, but we are actually leaving much more comfortable homes in order to go into them. Um, and so, I don't know, there's something about that that, that strikes me where there's this opportunity to see that the same thing is both a vast improvement in certain circumstances and a vast downgrade in other circumstances and how that sort of lets us view our dwelling places in a different kind of relation to other things the rest of the year. Okay, great. So the, so the same, you know, if we imagine um, that, you know, the Sukkot that we have are the same as the Sukkot that they had in the desert, which probably not, um, right, you know, but in other words, if we if we take that frame, um, or you know what, better yet, if we come back to this picture, um, the tents in the picture on the right means something very different to the people who are living in that encampment than they mean to the families from BZBI and Makor Habracha who go camping every October with their kids. Right, and it could be the same tent bought at the same outdoor store. Um, but the significance of it, the meaning of it is very different, which I think, Miriam, is what you're bringing up about the Sukkot, right? Like the same Sukkah means something very different to those of us who say, you know, wow, we get to enjoy this kind of last gasp of nice weather um, than they might have meant to our ancestors who were moving through the desert and would have been exposed to the harsh elements if not for the Sukkot. Um, on the other hand, there's something interesting also about this line, Ki vasukot hoshafti at B'nai Yisrael, as if like B'nai Yisrael couldn't have figured out for themselves how to make basic shelter for themselves in the desert. Like, you know, if you think about, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a, your typical sukkah, like you can put it up in a couple of hours. Um, it's a very sensible thing for you to take through the desert with you. You know, as you're traveling on a multi-year journey, you set it up. When it's time to move, you take it down, you move it, you set it up again. Um, it, you know, it seems likely that if, that they would have figured out something, right? Like, like on the one hand, it's an alternative to abject homelessness. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine that they would have like, laying around in the sun going, oh, we're wasting away, poor, well, maybe the actual Israelites in the, in the Bible would have done that, because um, they were like that, but, you know, kind of writ large, right, it's the kind of thing that most halfway resourceful people could have figured out for themselves, um, and, and I think your, your essential point that um, a, a given object could mean a very different thing in two different contexts is really important for us to hold on to. Again, like I keep thinking about those tents, you know, on the parkway, um, you know, a tent means something very different to someone who's camping for recreation than to someone who is camping for necessity. 
But hey, do you think do you think our forefathers when they left Egypt, forefathers and foremothers, when they left Egypt, really thought about packing up the equivalents of tents? I mean, they didn't even they barely had time to let the to, to let their bread rise. Um yeah, but they had enough time to bring enough gold to make a cow. That's true. I mean, that's look, there's right, so there's a lot that's ambivalent about the story, right? The Torah tells us that um, they didn't have time to let the bread rise. But if you go back about a dozen verses, um, God has already commanded them to eat the Korban Pesach with matzah. So there's, a, there, there's already um, ambiguity in the narrative of the story. Um, you know, and, and so th this comes back to another thing. That, um, I wish I could remember where I saw this. It's in one of the modern commentaries. Um, if you look in um, Parshat Truma, um, and in those parshiot at the kind of the things that they made the Mishkan out of in the wilderness, there's, there's dolphin skins and acacia wood and kind of all of these things. Um, and one of the things that people like to, you know, when they're feeling like they want to poke at the Torah, they like to say, like, where would they have gotten all of that stuff, these runaway slaves in the desert? Well, there were trade routes that crisscrossed through Sinai. Um, and it turns out that, um, that Sinai was the kind of place where you could probably get your hands on almost anything you wanted to get, not only things that were available locally, but all kinds of things coming from Spain and India. Um, because of the way the trade routes were converging through that peninsula. Um, so even if they didn't think to take it with them, um, it's not unlikely that they could have gotten their hands on the materials they would need to make at least enough shelter to keep themselves out of the elements. You know, if we're, if we're, if we're thinking about bare survival, um, I, you know, I think the this question, Rabbi Annie at our staff meeting today was talking about there's a midrash um, and Rabbi Eliezer says, you know, Sukkot or Sukkot. It meant that they had these temporary houses that they moved from place to place. Uh, Rabbi Akiva says Sukkot or Ananeha Kavod, the clouds of glory that God you kind of used as like a canopy over the entire Jewish people um, that were like a miraculous thing. I think part of what's motivating Rabbi Akiva there is kind of precisely this, which is like, they don't need God to give them tents, like tents they can get for themselves. Um, even if like, I, I maybe wouldn't know how to make a tent, but people who lived in the Bronze Age would have known how to make these things, um, just because of the time they were living in and the, the environment that they were living in. Okay. Oh, do you have, a, sorry, I can't see your hand because you're behind me. But you can see it on screen. I know, but I'm not looking at myself. Sorry. Okay. Yes, Adalia. Uh, well, like what you're saying about what Rabbi Akiva said, um, we like learned at school that um, the reason why it has two and a half walls is like put out your arm, then turn it, then turn your hand in. That's two and a half walls, which is like a hug. Um, I don't know if you can see, I'm doing this with my arm. That's two and a half walls. Um, and so going into the Sukkot is supposed to be like you're leaving. You're not supposed to see your house is sheltering you. You're supposed to be like going into like Hashem guarding you. So I think maybe it is that like they had these like physical Sukkot like for themselves, but Hashem was like protecting them. And so maybe that's why we're supposed to go out into these Sukkot and be like, like kind of what Miriam was saying, like it's the same um, shelter, but for Bnei Israel, like Hashem guarding them was like, like this physical Sukkot that they like made for themselves were guarding them from like the elements, but Hashem was like guarding them from like their fears and like whatever, I don't know. Um, and so maybe we're supposed to like come out of our houses and kind of experience the fact that like the Sukkot is like kind of guarding us from like the elements, not like rain, but like, I mean, it's shady in here. Um, but also that then, like, because we're leaving, we're, we, even though we have less physical shelter than we're used to, um, we still, so, like, we have less physical shel shelter than we're used to in the Sukkah, and B'nai Israel had more physical shelter than they would have had otherwise in their Sukkot, 
but maybe it's kind of saying even though like Miriam was saying, the physical Sukkot mean different things. We still have that same protection from Hashem. That's beautiful. I've never heard that Even image before like, of like the two and a half walls. Yeah, Rabbi like, Friedman. That was great. Great, Ogelia. All right, so uh, we're going we're gonna to dip into the next, uh, which comes from uh, the Mishnah in Sukkah. Um, and this is just kind of the first little bit of this Mishnah. It says, Kol shivata yamim adam ose sukato keva uveto arai. All seven days, a person should make their sukkah permanent and their house temporary. Um, so without getting into, I mean, there's, a, there's an enormous elaboration on this in the halakha. Without getting into all of that, um, if we could just do first impressions, what, um, what, is, what does this say to you or what does this bring up? Matt, I, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. It's a little bit noisy here, but I was thinking this is an interesting juxtaposition to the 22nd Street encampment, um, just the language, because now we have a situation where there's now permanence to their quote, quote, close quote, and they don't have any housing, so it's not even temporary housing. So I just think it looks interesting as in juxtaposition to that. I want everybody to hold that thought in their mind while we're here before we get to the next source, because um, we're gonna come back to that, that uh, question or that thought that Matt just raised. Um, other, other immediate reactions to this Mishnah? It makes me think a little bit of Purim, like things being turned upside down. Yeah, so there's a big reversal happening here because the the house that's made out of you know wood and brick and all of the sturdy things is supposed to be temporary, and the sukkah that has branches on the roof. Um, I mean, you know, if you were um, if you were at BZBI Zoom services yesterday, um, the kiddish conversation was everyone went around and told their story of the time their sukkah blew over. Um, <laughs> Right, and so there is this thing, which is like this thing that is like rickety and kind of questionable is supposed to be the permanent house, and um, and the um, and the house that's actually sturdy and right there is the temporary, um, right? And so there is that echo of Purim of the the reversals and the upside downness of things. Um, and, you know, and let's take that back to what Matt was saying, right, of this way in which now there is this, this large and growing population in our city in which this, this paradigm is upside down for them. Um, oh, we can come back here if people have more to say about it. Um, but I would, oh, Matt disappeared. I was going to have Matt read the next, um, oh, well. Um, is uh, somebody willing to read this? So this comes from uh, Jill Jacobs' book. Um, and if, is somebody willing to read this passage for us? Yeah, I'll read it. Great, go for it, Barbara. A permanent home must, by definition, be permanent. The sukkah derives its significance from the contrast between it and the homes we live in during the rest of the year. If we did not have permanent homes to which we could return at the conclusion of the holiday, then the sukkah would lose its meaning. You could hardly expect a person living in a homeless shelter or on the brink of losing his or her home to appreciate the temporary impermanence of the sukkah. Appropriate year-long housing, we might infer, should be guaranteed for a significant period of time and should not feel to the resident as temporary and insecure as the sukkah. Right. And so this is Rabbi Jacob's um, own commentary on the Mishnah that we just saw, and it's exactly to Matt's point that um, the, the, our whole appreciation of the significance of the sukkah as a ritual, as a mitzvah, is dependent on it being in contrast to our living some other way all the rest of the time. Um, right, you know, and, you know, and even in that, like, it's significant, right, that we build our Sukkot in proximity to our actual homes. You're not required to build it next to your house, but we all do. I mean, in part, because, like, that's where we have the legal right to do it. 
Um, but it means, and, and we're in and out of our homes constantly, or I'm in and out of Rona and Eric's house at this point, but um, you know, you go inside and you refill the water pitcher and you come back out and somebody goes inside to the bathroom and they come back out and you go in to get more food and you come back out or you go get a book and you come back out or whatever it is. Um, we're constantly engaged in the contrast between um, the sukkah and, um, you know, it's interesting, she kind of downplays this, but um, when she says here uh, that, that appropriate housing should be guaranteed for a significant period of time, our use of the sukkah is limited in time uh, because we are actually prohibited from using the sukkah in the immediate days after Sukkot. Uh, because of the prohibition of Baltosif and there's complicated boundaries around that, right? But like we use the sukkah for seven days and then you have to take a break and you're not allowed to use it. And then if you want to treat it like a gazebo for the rest of the year, you can treat it like a gazebo for as long as the weather holds out. Um, but, but there's, the sukkah is by design temporary in contrast to our real houses which um, you know, Rabbi Jacobs is reading the Mishnah to say our real houses, we are expected to feel about them like they are open-ended, like we're going to get to live there for as long as we want to live there. Um, you know, which again, I think for most of us is the way that we feel about our houses um, and, is, and is not the way we feel about our Sukkot. Um, and, and she opens the circle here, not only to those people who are actually camped out on the streets, but to the people who are living in apartments or houses uh, that they are on the verge of losing, right? Um, and, she, and she talks about, I'm just gonna, I wanna get the term right. Um, um, the high cost burden. Um, she cites a 2004 report that one third of Americans suffer from housing problems. And among those housing problems are high cost burden, meaning people who are spending 50% or more on, of their household income on housing costs. Um, and, and the reason why that's a problem is because it's not really sustainable uh, to spend you know, 50, 60, 70% of your household income on housing. People in that situation are you know, kind of one car accident away from not being able to afford to maintain their living situation. Um, and, and so the, the ripples of this kind of in contemporary American society are much greater than the people that we see actually living on the streets. Um, but that the, the implications of housing insecurity um, you know, for people who can't afford housing or for people who are living in substandard housing um, and so on, um, there are many different echoes of this. Um, comments comments on, this, on this commentary before we move on. Um, so, hang on, let's see. okay, here we go. So um, we're going to circle back now to the Torah. Um, and the Torah here is envisioning um, a scenario in which there's a poor person in, uh, it says, Bechad Recha, in, in one of your towns or in one of your gates. Literally, it's gates, but it, it's using the gate to refer to the town. Um, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. You have um, a question? Well, I just, something that stood out. To yeah. Me. Um, it said like your brother. So I'm thinking like that refers to only Jewish people. Okay, good. So the first question here is achicha. How do we understand achicha? Um, what other questions do people have about the text? Let's kind of gather the questions here. So, so what does it mean, your brother? And does that mean then that we're talking specifically about Jewish people, which it seems that most of the homeless population in Philadelphia is probably not Jewish because most of the population in Philadelphia is not Jewish. I guess what also, what does lend mean? Um, 
does it mean lend someone with interest or you know, charge them for for whatever? No, so we, we know that it means without interest because elsewhere the Torah prohibits interest in in clear terms. Okay. Well, does lend, but does lend definitely mean that you're giving it without? Sorry, forget about interest. Does it mean that you're giving it to the person rent free or at a discount or? What does Len really mean? Okay, good. Yeah, and this, and I'm not super familiar with this word Havet um, to know. Give me one second, because I'm just going to check a different translation real quick. While you're checking, I'll say when you first, when you opened your talk by saying that there's very little mention of homelessness, my first thought was, is that because people provided for each other and no one ended up being homeless. Ah, good. Well, good thought. Wow. So, so that was exactly the question that I put last night to Dr. Ann Albert, who uh, in addition to being a good friend and a BZBI member is also a scholar of medieval Judaism. Um, and so after kind of going through all the sources and going through all the source sheets and then going into Rabbi Jacob's book and finding that Rabbi Jacobs also was finding that there's not a lot about homelessness. Um, so I called Ann and I said, like, was this just not a problem for that? Like, you know, it's like, was, was it the case that homelessness wasn't a problem? Um, because one of the things that uh, Rebecca, my wife Rebecca suggested was it could have been the case that there were different understandings of land ownership. And if you were a peasant who was sharecropping on someone else's land, you were entitled to put a hut up on that land, even though you didn't own the land in the way that we think about land ownership, um, that it may simply have been that there was not the opportunity to be homeless because you could pitch a tent or you know, everyone was building a structure wherever they were for themselves to live in. And so we had people who couldn't afford food. We had people who couldn't afford sufficient clothing. Um, we had people who couldn't afford dowries for their children for marriage, but you didn't have people who literally didn't have a roof over their head because anybody could put a roof over their own head. Um, so that was, that was Rebecca's thought. Um, although I did for my bat mitzvah project last year, I worked with Project Home and they came to my school and talked a little bit about homelessness and they said, like being homeless isn't necessarily not having a roof over your head. Like the people you see out on the streets are a very small percent of the people who are homeless. Like being homeless can also mean like you can't afford like your rent and you're living in your friend's basement. You have a roof over your head, but they can kick you out anytime you want. It means like not being able to rely on yourself to, pro to provide shelter for yourself. So even if you were like, you know, like a peasant working for somebody and you could put up a hut, like you were still, they could decide that they didn't want you to work for them anymore and kick you out and then you have nowhere to live. Well, so that was, that was the question is maybe that was the case or maybe you could simply go, you know, take your hut and put it up somewhere else. Um, it's one of the things that I think Rabbi Jacobs is really good about talking about housing insecurity as a wider complex of issues in the way that you're talking about. Um, insufficient housing, substandard housing, actual homelessness. Um, and, and she talks also about um, you know, emergency shelters as being problematic in a sense that like it's a, it's a roof over people's head and it's not a, a home. Um, and Violet? I just seem to recall, of course, it wasn't in Torah days in, in Eastern Europe, you know, you read about that they had poor houses where people were able to go to, I guess they like homeless shelters when, when they, you know, when they came on bad times. Um, you just read about it sometimes in stories of Eastern Europe. Yeah, well, so that was part of the question that I put to Anne was, you know, was it just the case that anybody who needed to could sleep in the synagogue? And so it wasn't a problem of where are people going to sleep? Um, but it was, um, you know, there were other problems about what are people going to eat and what are people going to wear? But the, the synagogue was the solution for where are people going to sleep? Um, and she said, she said, maybe. Um, 
she said partially it was that she but she said also that um in pre-modern times there was a very clear understanding between the jewish community uh meaning the lay leaders of the jewish community and the majority population among whom they lived that the jews were going to make sure that their poor and mentally ill were not going to be a problem for anybody else um, and so, um, you know, and so the, the Jewish communal structure had a vested interest in making sure that you didn't have people living on the streets creating problems for the wider community. Um, and if that meant warehousing people in a poor house or forcing people's relatives to take them in or letting people sleep in the shul or what have you, um, that there was a, 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 to vary, you know, the formality of the arrangement would vary based on time and place, but there was always an expectation that the Jewish community would make sure that no Jews were burdening the majority population. Um, and likewise, the majority population took care of their own. Um, and this is something that, um, you know, a lot of scholars will point out, pre-modern societies were corporate in nature, um, you know, and you belonged to a group. Um, you know, and this is why uh, things like a harem would work. You know, why was it that if a guy refused to divorce his wife, you could use a harem, a, ba a social ban, to get him to come around? Because if you were a Jew, and the Jewish community wouldn't have anything to do with you, you literally had no place to be. I mean, you might have had a home, but you know, and maybe you could do business with some of the Gentiles because they don't care about the harem, but like, you're not a part of anything. Um, and if you're not a part of anything, you're nobody, right? I mean, people didn't have an individual identity in that same way. Um, and so, a, so it's possible that a big part of the, the not talking about homelessness um, you know, I said to Anne, like, when I went to look this up in the responsa index uh, in the bar -Alon database, like, I couldn't even figure out how you say homelessness in rabbinic Hebrew. Like, it, like, it just seems not to exist. And some of that may have been, um, some of that may have been that the community had structures in place to, like, the, this idea of chronic homelessness that we see in America wasn't allowed, people weren't allowed to devolve into that situation um, and to experience chronic homelessness in the same way. Um, look at, um, yeah, so we'll look at this. This is a midrash on the preceding verse, de mech soro, sufficient for his need. Um, and it says, one must feed a poor person, give him drink, let him sleep in his house and make a loan to him. And if he's unable to walk on his feet, one must give him an animal upon which to ride. Um, and this is, um, this, is a, a, this is a less well-known source, but it's a common theme in, the, in Hilchot Staka. Um, that we give staka according to the accustomed station of the person. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and you'll see in the Gemara and in Maimonides, it says, you know, if this was a person who used to have a servant and a horse, you give them a servant and a horse. Um, and it struck me, it always struck me as like, like it was there, it said it, but it was really hard to understand um, until the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. Um, and what happened in the course of that, uh, Rebecca's parents belonged to the Young Israel of New Rochelle. Um, and the, the, the shul is about 45% doctors and 45% bankers and lawyers. It's probably a third, a third, a third, bankers, doctors, lawyers, and there's like six people who work in other fields. Um, and most of the bankers and half of the lawyers lost their job almost overnight. Um, the doctors were mostly okay. And, and it suddenly sunk home like it wouldn't make sense in the context of Sadaka to say to a suddenly unemployed investment banker, well, just move into a housing project in the South Bronx and send your kids to New York public schools instead of Jewish day school. 
right? You know, and we can quibble about, well, should you drive a Toyota instead of a Mercedes? Okay, right, but, but it makes sense that you would want Sadaka to support these children being able to stay in the schools that they were already in and for these families to be able to stay in the communities that they were in. Um, you know, and I think that that's part of what De Mersoro is getting at. I think like the, the example of a servant and a horse looks funny to us. But when we think about like, you know, would you turn to a family in the shul and say, well, I guess you'll just have to, you know, move to a low income neighborhood and send your children to public school. It, it becomes much harder to imagine saying that to somebody whose family is accustomed to a certain standard of living. There's a different shiur about whether the standard of living in suburban Westchester and the South Bronx should be as different as it is. It shouldn't. And it certainly shouldn't be as racially determined as it is. Um, we're just not going to go down that sidetrack today. Um, and then if we come to Maimonides, um, we see again, um, Maimonides, this one's interesting because he, he starts to quantify it. Um, um, and here he's talking about Oniha Overme Makom La Makom, an itinerant poor person. Um, and he says, we don't give an itinerant poor person less than one loaf worth a pundayon. Um, and so if you're not up on your Talmudic currency, a pundayon is 350 milligrams of pure silver. It's about 27 cents at yesterday's prices. Uh, right, which I guess would be Friday's prices. Um, and you don't give less than the loaf worth of pundayon when wheat could be bought at four seah for a sella, right? In other words, he gives you the price of wheat relative to the price of bread so that you can adjust because wheat's a commodity and its price will go up and down. And so how, the value of the loaf that you give is linked to the value of the wheat. Um, but basically, when you can buy 57 liters of wheat for $13.09, then you have to give a loaf worth 27 cents. Um, I have no idea how much 57 liters of wheat would go for right now in America. Because um, I... because I think he's talking about unmilled wheat and we buy flour in the store. I'm not even gonna go down that. Uh, the part that we're looking at here is when he says, um, the Imlan, if he's staying overnight, we give him a bed to sleep on and a pillow to put beneath his head. Um, and he goes on from there. Um, and here's where I think Anne had actually the most helpful answer for us um, in thinking about the absence of homelessness in, um, in these sources. Um, because what happened after we talked, she texted me about an hour later to say, um, and by the way, nobody had homes the way that we have homes now. Um, that the, the, the idea of home is a late 18th and probably really 19th century and very bourgeois concept that I, I have a home that is my stable place of residence that belongs to me, whether it belongs to me because I bought it or it belongs to me because I signed a 12 month lease or a 24 month lease. Um, you know, what, what, she, what she reminded me was that people who lived, let's say in the 12th century, um, just wouldn't have thought about it in this way. And, and um, you know, when she texted me, she said, it's probably much more accurate to talk about where people stayed than about where people lived. Um, and that, you know, the idea that you might camp in the field that you were working in, you know, you would get hired on as an agricultural laborer for a season and you would camp in the field, um, she said, would not have had the kind of disreputable image that it might have for us. Um, that that was just kind of normal, what people did. You know, you, <clears throat> you signed on for the season and you camped in that field and the wheat harvest was over and the fruit harvest would begin and you would go and you'd camp out in the apple orchard and you would live there. And, um, you know, or you would go and live with a relative or, um, you know, the... Um, the scholar who was teaching children would live in the home of the family whose children he was teaching um, and, and so on and so forth like that. <clears throat> and that the, um, you know, this kind of a, the 
so that um, you know the issue might become if someone didn't have a place to sleep. Uh, so Maimonides will say, well, then you give them a place to sleep, right? Um, and that's why the sources will talk about, um, and and this is like such an interesting thing because um, Rabbi Jacobs brings these same sources in the book, and she makes what she acknowledges as a kind of a weak argument from silence that well it must have been the case that people had homes because the sources talk about giving them beds and they don't talk about giving them a home to put the bed in. Um, and it's interesting, uh, you know, her book is very explicitly dealing with halakha, and so she's dealing with the halakhic sources. Um, and it's a good reminder that when you ask a historian, and particularly a social historian, um, you'll get a different kind of an answer from a social historian than you'll get from a scholar of rabbinic text um, in that maybe actually this person that we're giving them a bed and a pillow doesn't have a home. Um, and maybe actually no one has a home in the way that we think about homes. Um, you know, people have places to sit, people have places that they stay. And if this itinerant person doesn't have a place to stay, we set them up with a place to stay. Um, and the last thing I want to, uh, yeah, Heidi, go, and then I'll, I'll offer one last thought. I think, you know, in a way, you've almost answered your own question here. The, you began by saying, you know, we really don't have that many sources that deal with homelessness. And, and what we do have, and we know we've always had, is what I'll call the Jewish safety net. So that could explain why there really isn't that much mention, and also the things you just said. It's, you know, it's not necessarily people had actual homes the way we have today, um, but what they had, they shared. And like you said, they gave a bed. They didn't say, oh, I'll let you come into my place and sleep, but I will give you a bed. But so I think that's why, it's why we may not be seeing as much reference on this topic um, in Torah or anywhere else for that reason. Yeah, and Rabbi Jacobs comes down where you do. Um, you know, she, her argument um, and, you know, allowing for the weaknesses of the argument that she herself acknowledges, I think it's a, it's a defensible argument. Um, but she argues that our, that our ancestors would have regarded housing as such a fundamental human right as to not even discuss its provision to people. Um, you know, that it was, um, so there's all kinds of questions about, um, you know, kind of how many assets, how much wealth would a person need to have before they're no longer entitled to draw from food assistance, for example. Um, but there's no discussion of providing housing. Um, she, she says, because they would have, our, our sources would have recognized housing as a fundamental human right, and therefore it was not even up for discussion. Right. Um, Barbara, did you have a hand up? Yes. I would not, I'm far from a Torah scholar, but I would imagine that the um, Torah and our literature, the Midrash has more, the Talmud has more to say about the systemic problems causing our current situation than an individual homeless, than how to care for an individual homeless individual person? Um, y yes and no, right? Because they don't, in this, you know, to the extent that, um, to the extent that the, 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 the epidemic of homelessness is rooted in um, economic insecurity and um, uh, insufficient education and insufficient health care and substance abuse and mental health, right? Like, uh, yes, our sources have a lot to say more in some areas and less in other areas, but a lot to say about systemically about um, all of those issues. Um, but they don't have anything to say not only about um, how do we address individual homelessness, um, but they don't have anything to say about how do we address systemic housing insecurity. Um, and so the last thing that Anne shared with me, oh, uh, Aunt Violet, you had your hand up. I just, wanted to, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that in the past, I think families have been more responsible for one another as well. 
Mm -hmm. so that if you had a family and you had a problem, they would take care of you, whether they liked you or not. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, and that was kind of, again, the kind of the origin of my question to Anne was, is this just a thing about the atomization of American society where families are not, you know, linked in that way and everyone's left to sink or swim on their own? Um, but her answer to me was really interesting, which is it wasn't so much families. It was that the Jewish community as a political body um, took care of people. Um, and we have picked up what I think is a Protestant and particularly an American Protestant tendency to read the Torah verses about tzedakah as talking about um, a, a private mandate to give charity. Um, and you can read the verses that way. Um, but you don't have to read the verses that way. And there's good reason to think that even when the Torah says, patoch tiftach et yadecha, open your hand, that the Torah may be talking about political social policy, that, um, that a society has an obligation to open its hand. And certainly Maimonides treats tzedakah as something that communal leaders can take from you and distribute to other people without your permission. Uh, less like Robin Hood, more like taxes, okay. uh, if we're looking for analogies, right? Uh, you know, for Maimonides, it was perfectly reasonable to think that the communal elders would simply assess everyone a 10% levy and take all of that money and feed people and clothe people and educate poor children and marry off orphans and provide health care and all of the kinds of things, um, you know, the, <laughs> the old deal, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but there was a social safety net, but it was not a social safety net that came out of the goodness of people's hearts. It was a social safety net that the communal elders took from people and distributed through, you know, trusted communal functionaries and had, you know, means tests and all kinds of things to um, distribute. Um, there were different ways of doing it, but all of the different ways of doing it were cl clearly sought equity. Um, and the question that Anne left me with, which is the question that I'm going to leave us with, is now that we are no longer subject to the Jewish community as the primary unit of our political organization, what does that mean for our response to systemic home housing insecurity? Um, because the Federation is not levying a tax on us, um, but the city of Philadelphia is and the state of Pennsylvania is, and the federal government is. Um, and so back to Odelia's question from the very beginning about Achicha, about your brother. Um, how, who is our brother is to some extent, and I think, you know, there's a reasonable conversation to be had about to what extent, um, but to, I would say to a large extent, brother is determined by the mode of political organization under which we live. Um, and, and so if we are living in an environment, in a situation, and, and I think that this is true for, certainly for the entirety of the Western world, if not for all of the contemporary life, but for the Western world and absolutely true for America, um, our religious community is a voluntary association. It's not a unit of political organization. Um, so then the, the social safety net, um, if once upon a time the Jewish community provided the social safety net as, as Aunt Violet was saying, um, that's because the Jewish community was, it's not because the Jewish community was more philanthropic then than it is now, right? It was because the Jewish community was a recognized unit of political organization. Um, and people were absolutely philanthropic and the Jewish community enforced the social safety net. The Jewish community, right? You know, it's the Jewish community built the shul that then people got to go and sleep in. And they heated the shul that the itinerant people were going to sleep in. 
and they provided them with food and they had they provided clothing and they educated children whose parents couldn't afford education and on down the list of all of the things that people did um you know, we know, I, I mean, you can look in, in kind of the historical records, I, you know, it wasn't that the doctors were treating people for free out of the goodness of their heart, although there certainly were doctors who were going to treat people for free, but in a lot of cases, the doctors were getting paid. It just wasn't the patients who were paying. Um, you know, and so, so we'll, we'll conclude with that as um, a question to walk away and to think about. Um, you know, if our unit of political organization is the city and the state and the federal government and our mode of political participation is voting and lobbying, then it may be that those are the areas in which we need to act out um, the Torah's verses. And particularly if we understand the Torah's teaching as talking about political mandate and not individual private charity, um, then we need to push our political organizations to act out these commands to open the hand and to lift up the weak and the marginalized. Um, so I want to thank everyone for being with me. This was thank you, fun. Thank you Miriam thank you. and Ricky Hila for organizing this. Uh, this has been a great treat and we wish you all Moedim Simcha. May your week continue to be filled with joy. Thank you, Rabbi Abe. Thank, thank, thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to very quickly, before you go away, put the link for the rest of the week's offerings in the oh, chat box. Okay. Um, join us tonight at 6 for a virtual scotch tasting. And truly, I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, it's um, American whiskeys, I think. OK, well, Nonetheless, I don't know how any tasting is going to work. So <laughs> the specifics are, you know, <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, tonight at six, um, uh, Rabbi Sean Zevit from Mishkan Shalom will be teaching tomorrow afternoon. There'll be a movement activity tomorrow evening. Um, and then I'll let you look at the schedule for the rest. But you have the link now because you got on today. Um, and please join us for the rest. Again, thank you so much to Rabbi Abe uh, and Odalia. Thank you to all of you for being here, and Thank I look you, forward Mark. to seeing you later in the week. Thank you for organizing, Miriam. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. Bye, guys.